Hello, church family. Happy Thanksgiving to you. I hope Thursday was great to you. Well, the weekend after Thanksgiving is always a really important weekend for the church because it's the beginning of the Christmas season. And I want to just challenge you this year to reach out and invite people to one of our great Christmas services on one of our three campuses, either at Richmond or at Missouri City or at the West End Campus. Invite somebody to come hear the music. This is one of the few times in a year that the friends you have that aren't interested in church and aren't interested in God might be. And they're just waiting for you to invite them. So reach out, simply say, hey, you ought to check out our church. Uh, it's got great music. They're gonna play a lot of Christmas music. And maybe, just maybe they'll come and explore what a relationship with Christ is all about. Now I'm especially thankful for this weekend because our teaching pastor, Blake Bergstrom's with us. It's enabled me to be with my family over Thanksgiving. He is great. You're gonna love his message today. It's very encouraging. I promise you he'll keep you on your toes. If you've never met him, you're gonna love his teaching today. Would you help me welcome my friend, one of my best friends, I love him so much. Would you help me welcome Blake Bergstrom. his best friend. Oh, I hadn't heard that yet, so I might have a hard time getting through this sermon now. Man, how are we doing, River Point? Ah, it's great to be here. My name is Blake, and I'm one of the pastors here. I'm always honored and humbled to help out when Pastor Kelly needs a break. I just want to welcome everybody here at the Richmond campus, everybody at Missouri City. I hope you're doing wonderful, especially if you're new. Go, go meet your campus pastor. He's amazing. And I just want to say hello to everybody at West End. Man, there's a whole lot of new folks come. We're just so glad that you're here with us, and I hope that you had a fantastic Thanksgiving week. I, I had a wonderful one. I've just recently moved to Tampa, Florida. So everything's sort of new and weird, you know, like we're unpacking and it's kind of strange, but it was great to be with my family. That's where my father-in-law is. So to hang out with him and have some adventure. We all went to the beach together on Thanksgiving Day. I have a picture for you of my family at the beach. It was roughing it for Jesus. So that's, that's us there. They were all on my back and they're heavy. Don't tell them I said that. Um, so, so we also uh, went to this new adventure called the Wiki Wachi River. And so we went out on this river. We went paddling, kayaking for hours. And I want to show you a small little clip of that experience. Here we go. Oh, my gosh. This place is just magical. Who knew Florida was, like, so awesome? <laughs> Are you guys enjoying this? Huh? Yeah. Montana? Dude, it's so cool. Okay, you guys, we better make this turn. <laughs> so right after that, our daughter was um, eaten by an alligator, <laughs> and it was really traumatic. No, I'm just kidding. So, man, it's great to be here. I'm fired up to be here. We're in this series right now called Experience Love, and we've been talking about God's lavish love that's just like unconditional, that's poured out on us abundantly. That's what we talked about last week. So if you didn't hear that, I encourage you to go back and enjoy this study because it's been a really great study and I think it would really help you. So um, I just want you to do something really fast. Turn to the person beside you. I want you to look them in the eyes and say, I love you. And then say, there's no shame in my game. Go ahead. I love you. There's no shame in my game. That's right. I hope that <laughs> I hope that a lot of you heard that over Thanksgiving from your family, heard it over and over. If you didn't hear that, I think this is a great place to hear that at church, to hear, man, I, I love you. I think we should say it more often to one another. So I, I love that we just did that. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to dive into 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. That's where we're going to be, 1 John chapter 4. Here's what it says. Dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. You must test them to see if the spirit they have comes from God. Now, this is like really light teaching. <laughs> like, hey, it's happy Thanksgiving. We're going to talk about testing the spirit of God. So anytime somebody stands up to proclaim God's truth 
and to speak the words of the Bible and about God, I want you to know you shouldn't take that for gospel. Not from me or from Patrick or any pastor. You should always test that in the spirit to see if it lines up with the scriptures. And also that what we're saying bears witness with your spirit that's inside of you. And so that's kind of what he starts off by saying that because John's serious about protecting the church. And so he's starting off this passage saying, man, listen, you guys, don't listen to everything. Test and see if the spirit comes from God. For there are many false prophets in the world. This is how we know if they have the Spirit of God. This is how. If a person claiming to be a prophet acknowledges that Jesus Christ came in a real body, that person has the Spirit of God. Now, why, why do they have to say that Jesus had a real body? That's sort of a, that's sort of a bizarre thing to say that that's how, that's how you know, right? Well, when Pastor Kelly uh, taught the very first week of this series... He explained that um, one of the biggest religions that were a threat to Christianity was a religion called Gnosticism. And he was, he was letting us know that John, in this passage especially, in chapter 4, is trying to dismantle one of the most dangerous teachings to the teachings of Jesus. It really threatened the early church. Uh, this was influenced by Greek philosophers as Socrates and Plato. Uh, they, they believed that matter was evil and spirit was good. So everything done in the flesh didn't matter because it was evil. And real life was only in the spiritual realm, which made for some really twisted practices in Gnosticism. They also claimed to have some kind of like enlightenment, right? So gnosis, that word, actually means to know. So a select few had like this supernatural knowledge and they'd walk around and say, we know a bunch of stuff about a bunch of stuff, like supernatural enlightened stuff. So they'd like walk around and act enlightened in their Greek Roman robes, right? So just kind of think back to what that probably was like. So here we find John trying to help teach how to build a defense against this first and second century belief. And as you can imagine, since Jesus was human, and which is matter, it's a physical being, they discounted that he was God. They had a very hard time embracing the idea because they believed in the all-powerful Greek gods who were nothing like humans. They also feared these gods, thinking that every storm was punishment from them and every lightning bolt came straight from Zeus to strike you in the face, right? So, so this is why John would teach the importance of making false teachers say that Jesus came in a real body. It would quickly show if the false teacher really was a true believer in Jesus and if he was led by the Spirit of God. Are you guys tracking with me? That's sort of a lot of teaching. But here's what's going on. So this is still true today. Here's what's ironic to me is that to today, it, it was still, it's still being taught from 2,000 years ago. Today, we say the words, man, whatever feels good, man, just do that, right? Like, whatever's right for you, like, that's not, it's not on me. You just do what you want to do because that's what matters the most, whether, whether that's some sort of sexual sin or struggle with porn or as far as abortion, that's just a modern-day form of Gnosticism. It doesn't matter what you do with your body. It's just matter, which doesn't matter. Are you guys tracking? So that's why they said that bodily form stuff just didn't matter. So for me, I graduated in the class of 1992. So I'm a prodigy of the 90s, and back then, R. Kelly was really hot. And so I'm going to help you understand Gnosticism by teaching about a song from R. Kelly. <laughs> I'm so excited about this. This is really dangerous, and, but I have prayed over this, so here we go. Um, here's the song that R. Kelly, R. Kelly said. I know what you want and what you need. So bring your body to me. I'm not fooling around with you, baby. My love is true. With you is where I want to be. Girl, you need someone like me to satisfy your every need. I don't see nothing wrong with little... Now, if you thought I was going to say that in church, <laughs> if you knew what the next words are, you stop thinking that. And if you don't know, don't look it up. But... <laughs> But I need you to just switch this around, right? So we belong to God. We're children of God, right? And I have children, and they're all four beautiful blonde daughters. 
that are gorgeous. And so imagine a young R. Kelly come up to me and saying these words, Mr. Bergstrom, I know what you want, what your daughter wants and what she needs. So bring her body to me. I'm not fooling around with you, baby. My love is true. Mr. Bergstrom, my love is true. With you is where I want to be, girl. You need someone like me to satisfy your everything. I don't see nothing wrong with little. And I'd just be like, Mr. Kelly, with a little what exactly are we talking about? Because this is my daughter we're talking about. I just want to say something to you about my daughter. She belongs to me. And in my household, we believe something that's very true. We are children of God. And when we know that, we are offspring of God and we're a child of our creator. And when we know who we are and who we belong to, we willingly give ourselves completely to God. Physically, spiritually, and emotionally, we give our bodies to him and everything we do and say should be a reflection of him. So then it matters what we do with our matter. Our bodies were bought with a price on the cross and they became a dwelling place of God, an abiding place for God to live in. And because of that, he gives us his spirit and he abides inside of us. He tabernacles inside of me. I become a sanctuary for God to live. He gives us the strength because of his spirit inside of us to overcome the cravings of this world and the deception of this place seems shallow and cheap in comparison with the lavish love of our creator, God. So we want to experience the lavish love of God, Mr. Kelly. We, we really don't think that you have exactly what we want and what we need. We're not going to find it in you or in this world. We're going to find it in him. See, 1 John 4 says this, and you, you need to hear this. But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people, speaking of the false teachers, because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. Will you guys say greater? Greater. Every campus, one more time, greater. greater. God is greater. God's greater than the world. And sometimes I think we just blow over that and act like that's not real. But I've got good news for you today, online, no matter where you're at in the world, Missouri City, West End, I need need you to hear this. God is greater than your problems. He's greater than the people trying to bring you down. He's greater than your financial struggles. He's greater than your relational challenges. My God is greater than anything that you're trying to overcome because he already won. The victory belongs to him, and we can rest in that. We can have peace because of that. Jesus Christ overcame death, and so the sting of his, this fallen world has got nothing on us. We are his children, safe in his arm, protected and secure because our God is greater. Yeah, that's true. So I know many of you over the holidays, it's not easy. And I know that there's a lot of pain, especially if you have loss in your family. We experience this every year in my home because my wife lost her mother a while back. And so it's been interesting to me to watch my wife, who has really lost security in her life of her mom, her mom's voice and You know, her mom in helping her raise her kids, her mom in helping her with the recipe. She'd call her like twice a day. She was so close with her. And so it's been interesting to me to watch my wife out of sort of a pain and a brokenness of insecurity become the security for so many people. So even though she doesn't have that anymore and it's sort of a void in her life, my, my mom hasn't, hasn't really been that. She didn't step in and become that. Instead, my wife is sort of the strength in a lot of ways for my mom. My new mother-in-law, uh, who my father-in-law remarried, she, my wife is the strength in her life, and she pours into her constantly. And I'm telling you, my, my wife is like a ca- Cadillac when it comes to, like, class A women. She's, she's like, I'm sorry, she's sort of the best of the best. And she's 
also so strong. I just see the strength in her. So all of my daughters all come to her. They want to emulate her. They, they look up to her, and she is the security for, for my daughters. But there's also, as she's looking up, sort of like she's also the security for people much older than her. Now, I say that to you because I think many of us want to try and find strength in people, and we want to find our security in people. And we, we, we just like our Kelly would say, he, people tell us they have what we want and what, what we need. And so we sometimes like always trying to find that, whether it's by a bunch of likes online or whatever. We're trying to always get feedback horizontally. But my wife, she gets so much feedback from God vertically that all, all this stuff horizontally seems cheap. The love that she has coming from heaven just pours over into everyone around her. And I see so much strength in my bride. 1 John 4 verse 7 says, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God. Will you guys say these last words? For God is love. Now, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away the sins of the world. Can I tell you something that you need to hear today? You are loved more than you'll ever know by someone who died to know you. You're loved more than you'll ever know by someone who died to know you. Somebody say amen. amen. That's the truth and the good news that you can hear uh, over this Christmas holidays. And, and you need to hear that, man, when you might not feel like you have strength, when you might not feel like you have enough, you, you might not feel secure, you can go to a God who's greater because he died to know you and he loves you. It says in the book of James that every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights. And I think we often, like the Greco-Romans, who are fearful that our God is like Zeus, he's going to throw a lightning bolt at our face, right? And so we, we, we think that that's what God's like, but that's not his nature at all. We learn in this text that all love comes from God. That's what we just said. So we see God when we see his love being poured out. No matter where or who is doing the pouring, John's language is really strong when he says, if you don't love, then you don't know God. Wow, come on, John. That's a little, come on, that's a little heavy. But, but I've always said that this is the litmus test to know how much we really do love God, right? If you love vertically, then, then the outcome is always to pour out horizontally, and if you say to me, I love God so much, Blake, man, I just love him, but you're never really loving his people, I'll question how much you really love God. But if you show me someone that's crazy in love with people and always serving and always sacrificing, I'll show you someone that's crazy in love with God, right? Without them ever speaking a word. You, you can see God in his people when they're a reflection of his love. Why is that? Because God is love. That's his character. That's his nature. That's who he is. And he's inside of us. So what, is, what does that mean for us if God is love? Well, this is the statement that's heard around the world. That's sort of what, if you were to talk about the God of the Christians, Jesus' followers are supposed to be the embodiment of love. Because their God is love, right? That's what people know. If they know anything about Christianity and who we are, they know, they know that God is love. And that has a huge appeal. But what does it mean? What does it mean? Well, well here's two things that it doesn't mean, okay? Number one, God is love doesn't mean that love is God. It's very easy to look around the world and conclude that, that love is the greatest thing. It's what sells it's every book's thesis and every song's best lyric. When we are in tune with the Spirit of God, then the rhythm of love is the song that we sing. It's what we're all searching for, especially, especially Bono. Apparently, he still hasn't found what he's looking for. 
Yeah, somebody <laughs> likes you too here. So here's just a few of well-known courses. Maybe you've heard about love. What, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that's there's just a little too little love, right? All, all we need is love, love, love. Everybody's Need somebody to love. The greatest love of all, right? Find me somebody to love. Everyone knows it. Love's the greatest thing. Even Paul, even Paul said that three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is what? Love. So the pop singer's verse is love is God. That's what the pop singers in our culture would say. But that's not what our verse says. Our verse says God is love. Which means we can say, listen, I, I know why you think love is the greatest thing, but God is greater than the greatest of the love that you've experienced in the natural. It's not human love when it comes from God because it's not fleeting feeling that comes and goes. God's love never comes and it never goes. It always was and it forever will be because he's the source. He's the fountain, and his love is, is different. It's supernatural. It's unconditional. His love is everlasting. It's never changing. Now, the, the, the greatest expression of love on earth is found inside of a marriage, right? And even then, it's a contractual binding contract. And, and we stand before a crowd of witnesses, and we'll say out loud, hey, I promise, I promise I'm going to try my hardest to love her. And we try to convince everyone to convince her, I'm, I'm going to love you. But since 50% of those actually work out, and 50% are divorced, then maybe we're not very good at love, right? Maybe, maybe we're not great at fulfilling promises. So we have to run to God to find love and understand it. And that's why we feel like love is the greatest thing, because we are actually creatures of the God who is the beginning and the end of where all love comes from. An endless supply, like a wave that's from the ocean, it's not that love is God, it's actually a better truth. It's the truth that God is love. He can't not be love. That's his Character, his nature, and his very identity. Now, the second misconception is that God is love doesn't mean that love is God, but also God is love doesn't mean that God is loving. Now, God is loving would imply that God has a number of qualities, and one of them is that he happens to be loving. And while that's nice and true, it's important that we realize that it's not just a character trait for God. It's his identity. Our God can't, can't not be loved. It oozes from him because that's who he is. That's, that's good news. When we get confused about the absence of love in our world and, and God in our lives, and we, we try to wrap our mind around like, okay, God, you're love, and I'm down here on earth trying to be love for you, it's easy to just get wrapped up in these big, massive questions like, why does bad stuff happen in this world? Why are there so many natural disasters and diseases and starvation and hunger and hatred and anger and tension and darkness? We must remember that that's not what God is. And that's never his plan. He's not some cosmic God up there laughing at us like we're puppets trying to make our lives miserable. Knowing that God is love, when we see him like that, we should recognize that we see him in the embodiment of his son, who is the perfect representation. So through the character and the teachings of Jesus, we see God. We can also know that the expression of his spirit is seen as, first of all, as love, right? Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's, that's the fruit. That's the outcome, the expression of the nature of our God who created us. You can also understand love. By understanding what is understood as the love chapter in 1 Corinthians 13. I'm going to blaze through it really fast. This is, this is what love is. Now, just think, okay, who's God? Here, here's who he is. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. Maybe you need to nudge your, your husband. It does not demand its own way. No, don't do that. It, it, it's not irritable. Don't nudge your wife. It, it, and it keeps no records of being wrong. He continues by saying it does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. Love never loses faith. 
is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. That's, that's what love looks like. That's what we can depend on. In 1 John chapter 4, uh, John continues by saying, Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to, will you say it? Love each other. Can I hear the West End campus say it? Love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us, and his love is brought to full expression in us. Isn't that a great thought? Like, man, when you see the love of God in us, his people, you can smile and recognize, oh, my gosh, hey, look, I, I saw that. that. That's what God looks like. It's an expression of his kindness, an expression of his patience. They are all the attributes of his spirit expressing himself through his children, proving the fact that our God is still sovereign, he's in control, and he's very much alive in the world today. And, and in the middle of this crazy, chaotic, tumultuous confusion of a season, especially in our country, it's so refreshing to see God's love alive in his people. And I see that here through you, River Point. Uh, you're the embodiment of God's love. Like everywhere I look, I see you serving. In, in a massive way, you're, you're loving, you're giving of your life. And it's so comforting to me to see that some people still hold on to the truth that, that God is love and he's inside of me. And so I'm gonna go be love. This is so important that John, he says, he says it again in this passage, 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. He says, God is love. I'm sorry, I, I think we messed up. <laughs> That's not the right verse, you stupid. I'm just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> I'll just read it from the Bible. 1 John 4, 16 says, God is love and all who live in love live in God and God lives in them. And we live in God and our love grows more perfect. Our love grows more perfect as we love his people. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment. We can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. I don't know anybody that does this as well as my bride. I've seen my wife's love become more perfect as she gives of herself in her own insecurity, in her own brokenness. She's poured out to her kids and, and to my mom and to women that are much older than her. She's this beautiful example and voice for so many people uh, around her. And I think that's what it looks like is how our love becomes complete or becomes perfect. It's by working in love even though you see your own frailties, your own shame, your own brokenness, and God still chooses to use you in the midst of that. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. So when I, when I look at all of that, it's a reminder me of, of who I belong to and who I'm supposed to be. And that's what I want you to hear today. I want you to be reminded of who you belong to and who you're supposed to be. Because we all fall short of all those attributes that you see in God that we're supposed to also embody and all the fruits of the Spirit and all the things in 1 Corinthians 13 of being the love chapter. That's who we're supposed to embody and become, Right? And so sometimes it's discouraging, like, I can't, I can't be peaceful and joy and kindness and love. Like that's, it's Sometimes that's so challenging. But knowing that God wants us to find ourselves becoming complete, becoming perfected in his love, that's sort of the day-to-day -day grind of how we go, man, I'm trying to grow to become like you, God. So help us do that. But we can't buy the lie that this world has what we need. And that this place can satisfy us. Or that you need anything other than God himself. He is what you're looking for. He's the answer to your brokenness. He's, he's the truth in the midst of the lies and the deception. He is the perfect love that drives out fear. So finally, in teaching this text, chapter 4, verse 18 of John, 1 John says, such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we're afraid, it's for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. And so I just want to remind you that sometimes you're looking at your own life going, I have so many 
insecurities and fear. I don't feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing for you, God. But I, I just need to tell you that fear and faith, fear and God's love can't coexist. They're, they're polar opposite of one another. If you have faith and believe in God's love, it drives out fear. Fear doesn't have a place there. So I'm going to tell you sort of a silly story of how I overcame fear recently. I was at uh, a Sela concert, uh, and um, it was an amazing concert. And uh, Dr. Tony Evans was preaching. And so apparently, uh, uh, Tony Dungy, the coach of the Indianapolis Colts for, forever, and now a sports broadcaster, you might know who he is, uh, he was there. And he walked into the, the, the front lobby there, and I, I saw him. And I was like, shut up, dude, that's Tony Dungy. No way. Tony Dungy's at church. Who cares about some preacher? Tony Dungy's here, right? And so I saw him leave his family, and he walked straight to the bathroom. And I was like, here's my chance. So I follow him, right? I'm not joking. This happened. And he goes to the stall. I'm like, man, I'm picking the stall beside that guy. And so I stood beside him and beat, and I went to wash my hands. And I, he was right beside me washing his hands. And I said, hey, coach, it was an honor to pee beside you. <laughs> it's a true story. It happened last week. <laughs> And so uh, I said, do you mind if I take a picture with you? <laughs> and so he let me take this picture of him. <laughs> this is me and Coach, and he doesn't seem too thrilled. <laughs> and I, I was like, I don't even care. There's no shame in my game. <laughs> and so um, perfect love drove out fear, I guess. <laughs> There's my tie-in for the scriptural. <laughs> Listen, I, I do want you to know something. The last verse that I'd like to close with is, we love each other because God loved us first. He loved us first. God loved you first. I just want, I want you to hear this. If you're, if you're brand new to Christianity, you don't understand any of this mess, can I just tell you something? Like, it's real. God loves you. You can know that, not because I told you first, but because God loved you first. I, I don't want you to follow me so you can be like me. I don't want you to believe like I do so you can be a part of the cool club. I don't even want you to believe all this so you'll start serving and giving. That's not the point. The point of me telling you that Jesus loved you first is so you will follow after him and become like him. Him, that's the point of finding and experiencing the love of Jesus is for you because we want you to be made complete in God's perfect love. Who wouldn't want that? So will you guys pray with me? Oh, Father, we're so thankful for you this week and thinking about how good you've been to us and how, how you help us drive out our fears. You help us to overcome our insecurities. You help us to battle when we are struggling with massive pain and brokenness in our life, the loss of loved ones and the, the struggle with finances. There's so many things that are in this room or online or at West End or Missouri City. I know, God, that there's all kinds of people that are listening going, I need you, I need you. I pray, God, we wouldn't buy the lie that this world has what we need and what we want. We pray, God, that we would run to you to find what we need because you're the source of all love. You're the source of all life, and you give it abundantly. So we receive it today, God. We receive that you are the living, true God, and we believe in you with all of our heart, and we give our lives and our bodies and all that we have to you so that we can live for you. God, we love you. It's in your precious name we pray. Everybody said amen. Thank